<laughs> oh my goodness, so much fun. All right. Um, my name is Ruthie Engelke. I am the art and culture and the education coordinator of Cooperation Humboldt. Um, I'm here today though wearing my um, theater maker hat. I'm um, at this stage in my life, I am on the, uh, I'm the chair of the board of Redwood Curtain Theater, which is a, a small live theater venue that has been closed for the last year here in Humboldt County. Um, but uh, we'll be looking to reopen, you know, someday soon. Um, we're still working on that. Um, but uh, we, this group came together because we were not working. We weren't doing theater. So it was a really good time to stop and look at it. And um, here today with me, I've got um, two other representatives of the group. Um, and so we thought we'd start off by introducing ourselves a little bit, and then I'll come back and do a brief introduction about what do we mean by regenerative theater um, and, and what is our, our overarching question. And then we'll be working our way through a discussion here. So again, my name is Ruthie Engelke. I have, um, I don't remember not doing theater. <clears throat> it to me is like breathing um, to do theater. I grew up in the theater, um, in community theater. My parents were both involved in community theater and I grew up in that theater and I love the smell of the theater, that smell of sweat and anticipation and nervousness and makeup and moldy costumes and paint. Um, it's just a unique, I think they even wrote a musical about it, the, <laughs> the roar of the grease paint, the smell of the crowd. Um, and uh, I've, I've loved it always. I um, I went to um, I got my bachelor's degree from the University of Texas at Austin with a, um, a, a mostly in directing and and that's my favorite thing to do. I'm an actress too, but um, I really really like to direct. And um, I most recently directed The Revolutionist last year at Redwood Curtain Theater, and. Um, I'm also I was I'm also a retired teacher. I um, I was a theater teacher. And so nurturing theater and love of theater and a place where theater is regenerative is part of my heart and soul. And um, that's why I am here. And I would like to introduce my good friend and a comrade, Kate Hatfield, and let her talk about what brings her here. Hi guys, I'm Kate Hatfield. I'm here in Eureka, California. I've recent graduate from Humboldt State University and current employee of Planet Fitness Gym. I am trying to be an actor. That was the dream all along, but this gig economy, this hustle, it's, it's wearing me down. And I joined this group because it seems so hopeful to have us even imagine a world where we could have benefits and a livable wage in a non-hierarchical society, <laughs> but it's fine. We'll get there. I'm Kate. I'm just so happy to be here. I'm an artist, actor, writer, whatever needs to happen to put theater on, I'm willing to do it. <laughs> I have worked behind sets, in sets, on top of sets. I'm a fan and I will continue to be a fan all through <laughs> my life. So if there's a time and place for it, I think it's now the time for theater to be an actual sustainable way of living, right? I'm here to introduce my good friend Zuska, who is also a part of the regenerative theater and is perfectly good, <laughs> good at introducing herself. I will do it. Thank you very much, Kate Hatfield. Uh, so nice to see so many people here. My name is Zuska Sabata. I am a, a theater maker and a performer um, uh, with my base here in Humboldt County. I moved to Humboldt actually to go to a theater school located here in a small town called Blue Lake. Uh, the school is called Del Arte International and uh, it specializes in 
ensemble theater making and uh, original creating original material. So my path towards theater was a bit from left field. Um, when uh, uh, when I talk to my mom about this, I always feel like I have to chastise her for not recognizing my inherent theater traits because my grandmother was an actress, but I feel like because my mom had some conflicts with her, she didn't want to necessarily encourage that in me so directly. Um, uh, but my father's side of the family were very politically active uh, in Czechoslovakia, which is where my family's from. And what I ended up doing somehow subconsciously in my life is moving towards a kind of theatrical creation that has um, includes ownership of material um, and uh, keeps the decision making processes with the artist and uh, in a horizontal and a more horizontal um, power structure. Um, but of course, our realities um, are uh, locked up in, you know, two modes, nonprofit mode or profit mode of the theater world. Um, and uh, uh, both of those have hierarchical structures. And so my, my pathway, once I uh, graduated and started working, um, I worked for my alma mater or have worked for them for 10 years, um, have, have been uh, uh, trying to figure out how to um, negotiate those, those two different um, systems or situations, the one that I desire, the one that is more egalitarian and the one that I'm forced to interact with. And this is what attracted me to regenerative theater. I already was a big fan of Cooperation Humboldt. And um, when uh, I guess it was Ruthie who brought me in, um, and invited me in, um, I was very excited to have a conversation about <clears throat> what uh, regenerative theater, what that even means, how that can work. Um, and I'll pass it back to Ruthie to start us off. Thanks, Siska. You know, I am interested in, um, in the people here and what brought them to theater. So I'm going to share my screen. And while I do that, if, um, if you want to put in the chat, what is it that brought you to theater? What, what brought you into this discussion? What, what, what was interesting to you? Sounds like we've got a music director and a conductor here with us. Um, uh, theater was a safe place in high school. Uh, there's a dancer here to consider the intersections of the practices of regenerative dance. Looks like maybe lifting the artist, lifting the A, lifting the art. Uh, I took a recent tour. Oh boy, you guys are going too fast now. Okay, lifting story through music. <laughs> Uh, always wanted to be in a musical, but no experience. I do music, though. Theater is an emotional vessel and collective experience. I took a recent tour to Eureka Theater. We own a theater. I've always had theater in my life. Uh, my entry to theater was through writing. Someone told me I couldn't do it. That is the best reason to do something. Uh, I was brought up into theater as a young girl. Community theater in high school. When I'm on stage is the only time I know exactly what to do and say. Word to that one. Yeah, they give you a script so you know what to do. They even wrote a song about that one too. Want to hear it? Hear it go. No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and first tangent. <laughs> so, um, to under really kind of, uh, I want to kind of ground us a little bit as we begin to talk about. Um, and what is regenerative theater, uh, we're gonna kind of start with, well, what is not regenerative theater? Um, what I heard a lot from, from those answers and what I heard from, from, um, from, from Kate and from Zuska as well, was this kind of, 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 of place of belonging, um, a, a, you know, a, a striving there. I'm gonna get through these. Um, but um, things that did regenerate, uh, for the most part, for the most part, not not the one where you did it, you know, because you could somebody told you you couldn't. <laughs> but maybe that was regenerative for you. And that was healing. And that's what's really important. That is regenerative. I'm not going to tell you what's not regenerative. And um, but one of the first things that we're going to do is look at what is extracted 
because that's where we have the problem. That problem that Zuska was talking about that we butt up against of, of desire is, is part of this extractive worldview of, with a consumerism and a colonial mindset um, where we, our resources are, are there to be used and then basically thrown away. Now, that doesn't happen so much in the theater, right? We reuse everything in the theater. But one thing does happen in the theater, and that's extraction. And we really, really saw that. There was a real a call out at the beginning of, uh, of, of, last, of, of last spring when um, we had, after, after George Floyd was murdered and um, we had that rebellion, there was a call out there against theaters. There was a call out against Broadway. There was a call out here in our community, here in Humboldt County. We saw call, call outs, and I saw call outs among my colleagues across the nation calling out theaters for racism, um, and for this being, having this colonial mindset of theater. Um, so, but what we in regenerative theater, we started looking at, okay, how can we make theater that's based on regeneration? where we are working in cooperation, where we're actually focusing on what is our community. Like here's our usual theatrical model, right? It's very, very hierarchical. That's what we usually see. Um, but we really want inclusion, equity, diversity. These are cornerstones of theater making. This is, is um, who would want to see anything that's not interested in that? It's, it's, um, it's why would we not want to embrace diversity? And yet we don't. So here's some of our other, like this is um, how this began out of a document that uh, James Peck created and James is doing a, a workshop later today um, is what we've been showing, what I've been showing you here. Um, but I'm getting towards the end of my time and I will get excited and talk too much about a solidarity economy because that's kind of my thing. Um, but well, we did take some take up some of your time, uh, Ruthie, by introducing ourselves. Um, so since my block is the longest, I'm going to give you five more minutes. How do you feel about that? I can have five more minutes. <laughs> I just broke the structure. <laughs> broke the structure. Oh, good. Okay. Well, I'm going to use it for a warm up here. So yay! We have an overarching question here. So I want you to keep that in your head, which is how can we create theater that is regenerative instead of extractive? So we're going to do a warm up. So shake it out first. Just shake whatever you can shake and you can not look at the camera and nobody's looking at you because everybody else is shaking. Okay. Okay. And then get yourself still and find your breath. And see if you can sense how you're feeling right now at this moment. And I want you to make a shape with your body and you can move it if you need to that shows how you feel right now, right now in this moment. And I'm gonna do that so I can see them. Okay, I shake that off. All right, so Kate is going to talk to us next time, uh, next about the extract, that extractive theater model and lead a discussion on how is theater extracted? Take it over, Kate. Yeah, I was thinking of how to incorporate my experience, but really it's a shared experience that actors and artists have to contribute their time, energy, and money to a project without the promise or even hope most of the time of any sort of return, just to get our art out there. So, how, if anyone wants to raise their hand, um, how would you feel that theater in your experience has extracted more from you than you were uh, compensated for? 
And if you'd like to raise your hand, you can go down to the reactions button and press it and there should be a bar that says raise your hand and then we'll know what order and who's interested in talking. And if not, that's fine. I'll just start talking. <laughs> it might take a minute for people to gather their thoughts because that's a that's a pretty deep question, Kate. Um, In my experience, mm -hmm. I've interested. How about how about we do this? How about we do um, how about we do that, that an image that about how we feel extractive and give people a second to really think about it. Oh, okay. great! Thank you. Ruby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so so think about that. Um, how do you feel when, think of a time when you were working, when you, or, or some kind of problem that comes up that makes it hard for you to experience your joy and really work your craft the way that you want to do it. What is that thing that holds you down, gets in your way, extracts too much of you what are some of the what are some of the 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 things in the theater that um that weigh heavily on you make you go past your boundaries and you want us to make an image of that yeah okay like yeah. a physical image yeah a physical image of that and feel it in your body and make a physical image of what that feels like. I love these images that I'm seeing. I want to see them. <laughs> Let's nice. hold them a moment longer. Yeah. Ooh. Really nice. And tell us in the chat, what were you feeling? What was it? What, what were you feeling in that when you were holding that image? What, what, come up, what came up for you? Also, I think we got a raised hand. Sarah? We did, I wonder. Yeah, come back, Sarah. <laughs> You're like, no, nah, never mind. <laughs> um, Let's see. I'm unmuting you, Sarah, right now. If you, there we if go. you wanna Guys. contribute. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I have two screens. Um, so the, I don't have an image to share. Um, I was going to respond to the original question, which is that specific thing that is, feels extractive. Um, and there's two thoughts. So I'm actually a circus performer. I've been a professional circus artist for 15 years and, um, slightly different than theater. There's a lot of crossover, but there are two things um, that I feel are extractive um, for me that come up a lot and that I am exploring in a current body of work, which the first one is the consistent undervaluing of time that artists put into things. I think people only see the end product and they don't see years of idea building, um, set building, prop building, costume building, choreography. They don't see everything that goes into it. The consistent undervaluing of that, especially in a gig economy. Um, and then also for me as someone who was um, labeled and socialized female, someone's drilling something on the wall. Um, as someone who was labeled and socialized female, there's a lot that I feel is not socially acceptable for me to do with my actual physical body or ways in which I, as a performance artist, am inherently sexualized um, that leads me to shut myself down in what I envision myself being capable of and what I feel comfortable presenting. Exactly. There's an emotional and physical toll on our bodies. I'm still um, mute. Let's mute me. <laughs> You're doing great. That's right. So that drilling doesn't <laughs> happen. Go for it, Kate. Oh, I was... I was so interested in how you said that we're undervaluing time. I never even thought of time. I always think of money and my things and my energy, but time is everything, isn't it? Sure yeah. is. Can we get Tom? Yeah, Tom, what's your thought about how you've been uh, exhausted or exploited <laughs> theatrically? <laughs> well. 
I don't feel it. It's, I, I'm in I'm in two areas. I'm a professional musician. And what Sarah just said about the time that goes into our art, you know, when people say, well, we thought you'd play for free because it's a good cause. And I say, well, all my causes are good cause, you know, and so there, there is a lot of people out there that don't appreciate what goes into the, into the art, into the creativeness of the art. The, the, the theater side of me, and, and, and it's in perform and, and performing as a musician is also acting in a way. My theater piece is, was, was never meant to be income generating, but was meant to do the work of the movement. And so I didn't, the compensation from that was the audiences that would come in and the people who would be moved by what we did and would want us to come back and continue doing our work year after year after year. And, and, and so my time, that I, the reward for my time was the lives that we touched. And, and that, that was the compensation for it. And, it's, and in turn, it supported my music because the two are, are, are really related because I, you know, I performed, I sing in the, in, in the labor plays that we would do. The thing that becomes extractive is when people forget the solidarity of the movement and someone wants to be the star, someone wants to be the hero, someone wants to make it all about me and forget that it's all about us. And that's what becomes very draining. And that, that's, um, what was the word you, that, that and, and in a way it is, it becomes exploitative of everyone in the cast, of everyone in the movement that's trying to work together on this. That becomes very difficult for me. And a resentment builds between the creators and those who are able to patron the creators, no? It, it creates dissent in, in the whole troop because people lose the focus of, of, of why we're here. I yeah. see Eric Rez is uh, next up in our queue here. Eric? Thank you, Tom. I, I just wanted to, um, well, the first thing that came to my mind was time and then the, the, the exhaustion that comes from not managing time well. So I, I had about a 15 year break from theater and I just needed to get on stage again. And so I, you know, auditioned and I was casting a play and we rehearsed last year that was going to open before COVID, but didn't get to open. But um, got really close to it, got a seven or eight weeks into the rehearsal process. And um, where, I, where I felt the extraction was from the time and the, the time demand on being at rehearsals till 10 or 11 o'clock at night and then, you know, going to work in the morning. Um, and my, I, there wasn't enough hours in the day to like really um, restore rest, you know, to do both of my jobs well, my professional job as well as my, you know, pleasure job of the theater. So, um, yeah, I, I was reminded of that recently. Thank you. Let alone having a social life. It's always, I'm in, I'm in rehearsal, right? <laughs> we have another so, Aisha. And then we have Bobby, and then we should probably move on after that time-wise. There you go. Yeah, I feel like um, I, in some ways, I feel like I made a fundamental mistake in believing my teachers when they told me that my job as an actor was to defend the humanity of my characters. And I feel like going into a professional environment where you're expected to, you know, behave in a, in a professional conduct um, without regard for the animal that we're living inside of. Like my body doesn't know that the circumstances I'm engaging in over and over again in this like act of pretend are not real. And the expectation that somebody should call hold and then I have to like stop being in a mental place where I am like, say, trying not get, to get raped because like pretty much all of the things that I was cast at, as like one of the reasons I stopped acting was because I couldn't find any roles where I wasn't playing somebody whose identity was predicated by their sexuality. 
And the idea that I should like have to cut off that emotional negotiation of pretending to get murdered 10 times in a row in order to address a lighting cue in a polite way feels extractive. So true. So we have Bobby here in the queue. I'll unmute. Well, that's, that's huge. Before Bobby goes, that's just huge, Aisha. I'm so glad, thankful for you for bringing that up, um, the toll that that takes on your body, because you're right, the body doesn't know, and, that's, and, and the body can't lie, and, and we don't forget it, and then we not only have to stop cue, we have to go home and be somebody else, or, or go to our job, other job and be somebody else. So thank you so much for bringing that in. Thanks for the time. Go ahead, Bobby. Let me just uh, uh, see if I can get you unmuted, Bobby. There you are. Yeah. There you are. Sorry, I'm, I muted myself again so background noise wouldn't come up while I was waiting to speak, and then I realized I couldn't re unmute myself. <laughs> but yeah, I, I just wanted to say, like, I think the biggest problem I've had is that I haven't even really gotten to. Um, really explore my art and craft in a professional sense. There's always been kind of like a day job and bills and the need to survive under capitalism hanging over my head that just like keeps me from having the time and energy and capacity to dedicate to my craft that I would like. Yeah, I've heard uh, more experienced actors look down on newer actors because of, they didn't put the time into their craft. Like people have all this time to spare. Yeah. I'll get heated up. I should give it back to Zuska as well. <laughs> and I'm gonna go straight back to Ruthie. Pew! Pew! At least that's the direction for me. Pew! Pew! <laughs> um, all right, so now's the fun part. Okay, so that was our little, our little, um, what we call them like a little stitch and bitch session. But it's also, you know, the other thing that I wanted to point out though, before we leave the extractive, is that, because this is something that my partner says to, said to me, says to me when I'm in a play, how does, because, because I am able to work and, and, and move things around. It was like, how does somebody that has a 40 hour a week job that they can't go away, how does anybody do that? I'm like, well, they either don't or it makes them crazy. And, and that it, the elitism that becomes of that because it's who can participate in the theater becomes really, yes, exactly, Eric, participation is a privilege, exactly. And then we notice, you know, who, who isn't here and who's not at the theater. And that theater, you know, we're, we're living in, an, in an, a hierarchical model and if we're going to make it anti-racist and anti-hierarchical and, um, and, and not harmful to people, um, then it's going to be better for everybody. So what are the things that's, that are good though? Because why do we keep, why do we do it? If it's, if there are all these issues and all these problems and it wears us out and it takes a strain toll on us emotionally, why do we do it? What, what are the regenerative things about theater? What are the things that we would like to keep? And feel free to raise your hand or note in the chat if you'd like to speak about what would you like to keep about the theater. And I will tell you the one, the things that I'd like to keep about the theater. Um, and that's empathy. Um, we are able to see through someone else's eyes. Um, we are able to, to, to create that, but it also, it connects us as Shannon says, it can be a therapy. This is how we tell stories. It's how we repeat stories. Um, we get a catharsis out of it. We have community. We have those magical temporary moments you'll never see again. Being in a group with people in the audience, the collaborative process, imagining, feeding the soul, making friends, making meetings, the agreements we make in rehearsal, building something huge and ephemeral, creating worlds that help connect people of different backgrounds, 
connection, learning and evolving who I am and how I see this world. We need to share stories, stories of hope, stories that solve problems, point out fault, follies and create a vision for better ways of being. Learning control over our emotions and body. Boy, that's a big one. And somebody noted earlier, I remember uh, speaking about physicians that actors are often brought in to help physicians learn bedside manner and how to do that. Um, I've talked with disaster response um, folks that um, with the Red Cross who want actors to come in and, um, and role play and help people be prepared for that. Um, but also then to come in and, and take people's minds away from where they are um, and, and help them create. But I'm wondering if anyone else would like to share any, any stories of what is regenerative about theater for you. How about you, Zuska? What's what's regenerative for theater about you? Oh, we got Aisha. I just unmuted her. Yay! Hey. Um, I think that theater is the most humanizing medium. I think that attention is the most valuable gift anyone among us has to give in breathing lifetime, and theater is like occupies this special space where it reveals that attention is how you look at what you look at mm. and engages in tension in attention and i can think of no also just like the act of sharing physical space it like literally expands people's ability to see each other as human and I think we have a responsibility to that psychological gesture. Beautiful, thank you. Thank you so much for those words. Yeah, we do. We do have a responsibility to each other and, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's so different from, from you, can't, you can't be in a theater and totally remove yourself from the, what is happening on the stage. Um, I've even read that, you know, audiences' hearts beat together. They begin to, to go together because you know, that's where we're meant to. We're meant to do that. Um, so this is kind of the obvious point, I think, of, um, of what are the regenerative things about theater. Um, this, uh, this sense of community, of creating ritual, of, um, of creating empathy and understanding um, how to control our own emotions. I think these are really, really important. Um, but I think that our important question is, then how do we create regenerative theater? And Zuska, I think you're going to lead us through this section. Thank you, Ruthie. Um, so I'm sure we'll be returning uh, to the things we've already talked about. Um, so feel free, Kate and Ruthie, to jump in at any point if you feel like it. It will not offend me. So I've positioned myself perfectly to be blinded by the light from my window right at this moment. Um, so it's a big question, right? What do we mean? How do we make theater regenerative? Um, one of the things that I just noticed as we have gone through things which are extractive from the theater and things which are regenerative um, are that um, many of the resources that we named um, from the extractive brainstorm we had are actually valued with money in our system and our economic system. Whereas the resources that we named in terms of how they regenerate who we are as people are not valued with money in our current economic system, um, right? Time is generally compensated at a particular rate, whether that rate is equitable or not. Um, uh, gender norms or uh, let's, let's say the sexualization of bodies has a monetary value for uh, the performance industry. Um, our bodies themselves um, can be monetized, the, the, uh, the labor of our bodies, right? But when we talk about uh, connections and building community, 
and uh, learning fundamental um, skills that help us be a better community, be better people for each other. Um, those things aren't uh, valued with money, and yet, as uh, uh, Bobby mentioned, uh, if we decide to be professional theater makers, um, we have to learn how to make a living via a model that um, uh, really only accounts for things which are which are valued um, in our current system monetarily, and yet, um, many of the things that theater contributes to society and to individuals um, are not uh, valued in that manner. So how do we survive, right? It's like two different worlds side by side. And that's often how I, how I feel um, when I'm trying to live my life in a way. Um, so on that note, I wanted to solicit just your thoughts again um, about what types of changes, and feel free to be broad, make wide-ranging general statements to very specific things that perhaps you are already doing or want to be doing, or in an ideal world would do, um, to shift from extraction to regeneration uh, in theater. Again, these can be things that are totally ideal and utopian, they don't exist yet, or they can be things that you observe that you are um, participating in already or trying to um, implement already in your lives or in your practices. Um, <laughs> I just saw Aisha said, mute me. She's muted, it's happened, so it's all good. Um, so, uh, Feel free to type into the chat or I see a raised hand from Kate. <laughs> <laughs> so do you want to step in right away? Yeah, come on. Yeah, don't mind if I do. Um, I was listening to people talk about how their bodies can wear down and not just that, but like the, your brain wears down from the mental exhaustion of putting yourself through the same scenarios every time. And there could be a preventative way to take care of ourselves that is, also healthy and medical in a way, in the way that we help the medical community learn empathy. <laughs> if we could learn some ways to take care of our bodies in, in return, <laughs> it might serve for a longer career in both of our fields. Yeah, what I'm hearing you say is, is that, uh if we aligned health, uh, the health industry with uh, theater practices, performative practices, or art practices in general, both would benefit from each other. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to um, uplift some of the stuff that's happening in the chat before I get to Aisha. Um, many people are bringing up community supported models, like we have community supported agriculture, so we could do community supported theater. Um, there is a collective in um, Arcata that does community supported art, CSA, cooperatively owned theater spaces. Yes, working together seems to be, uh, pooling our resources seems to be a big, um, a, a, a big idea that helps. Um, I'm going to unmute you, Aisha. Hey again. Um, I think it's about... I mean, pooling resources, obviously, but just building a sustainability economy by uh, creating like shared networks of information that allow us to articulate our need in like clear and transparent ways and then connect with each other to um, be like making sure that our work is like uplifting to others in our community as it's just like sharing enough information that you could have work or a place to go or like people who understand you wherever you go. I'm not being very articulate, but um, that's when I'm gonna stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> this, brings, this brings me to though a place, I'm glad that, that, that you said that in your wonderfully inarticulate way. Um, 
which is this thing about um, looking towards uplifting others in the community and doing that in an authentic way. And um, as Ruthie mentioned at the beginning of the hour, um, the theater has been strongly called out this year for being extremely exclusive on many levels, um, culturally and structurally and um, economically exclusive. And um, one of the things that I think about a lot is, is uh, that privilege of being able to engage in something that doesn't actually support me, my basic, um, my basic material needs. Um, and I'm curious about uh, experiences that people might have had in this group of that kind of exclusivity in theater. Um, and how, excuse me, that's my dog. Um, uh, uh, because theater, theater tends to be a safe space for people who otherwise don't fit in, but then that transition into uh, the professional world, um, it, it, it's not clear on the surface, but there's a high level of codification of what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable in theater culture. Um, so I'm wondering if, if anyone would like to talk about an experience they might have had around um, theater being exclusive rather than inclusive of uh, uh, their respective community. And I'll just be quiet for a while to see if anybody pops up and would like to share. There's some great things in the chat as well, of course. Thank you so much for putting those ideas of yours in. So I shall prattle on if nobody feels like um, sharing about uh, exclusivity. Um, one of the, and I'll just share a small, a small um, anecdote from my own experience, which is when I first started doing theater in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, it was, again, sort of from left field. I was doing these guerrilla theater performances with a, with a group of people that had uh, sort of uh, brought me into the stuff they were doing in parks, um, uh, basically for friends and acquaintances that heard about these performances. But one of the things um, that I always felt was a huge challenge was like getting people into the theater. Like that seemed to be a problem. Like people would put all this work into plays and all this, all these resources into producing something. And then um, people wouldn't show up or people wouldn't want to show up. Um, the flip side of that coin, um, which I've, I've always felt pretty strongly about was that the performances, um, even though there was so much effort put into them, didn't really serve the audience. And so people didn't show up because they didn't want to spend their time in that space. Um, so these are, these are both for me where back then I didn't realize that's what it was about, but for me, ways in which theater was very exclusive. Um, it was asking people to self-select to come into the theater and also um, to be willing to sort of sacrifice their time um, to participate in something that didn't necessarily serve them, represent them, or speak to their needs or their true feelings or desires, um, the bubble of theater as it, as it so happens to be. Um, I'm looking at the chat right now, and somebody here, Bobby says, I remember people bragging in my high school thespian troupe that we had the only all straight read, very closeted thespian troupe in the city. That's very funny. Um, so, uh, ah, great. I've talked my way into more people wanting to share. Excellent. Julia. Hi. Yeah. Um, I just thought I would share, uh, a, a story of exclusivity that was kind of a milestone for me and reckoning with the fact that I need to uh, be more selective with the opportunities that I get as an early career actor because simply some things are not worth my time. Um, I was in an ensemble of an Oscar Wilde show uh, that I had been cast in that I was not being paid for and 
during rehearsal one day I had made the suggestion that I think my character was into women because it was like very much so implied in uh, in the way the scene worked um, and the director got very defensive about it at first and then at, uh, I went home after rehearsal and that evening I received an email that was just like pages and pages uh, detailing to me why that choice wasn't going to be an appropriate fit for this production. Um, and I just kind of responded and I was like, it's Oscar fucking wild. And uh, if this is your response to an actor having an idea, uh, then I, I don't need to be in your show. <laughs> and um, he responded to that email even like further berating me for my unprofessionalism. Uh, and I forwarded that whole email conversation to the rest of the cast. And I was like, you know, you can do with this what you will. And they did. And I, <laughs> I know some other people quit. And um, yeah, you know, it, some things are just not worth your time if they're going to be that exclusive with the stories they want to tell and their reasons for justifying that they're automatically excluding a lot of people. And yeah, it's not worth participating in that. Thank you, Julia, for sharing that experience. It just makes me think that one of the things we can do to change the theater models to not participate in those models that, um, that do those kinds of things to us as creators. Um, Casey, all right, there you are. Yeah, hi. Um... Yeah, I just, there's something for me around just um, the, the theater's like accountability or like at least that's the way it was explained to me as like a playwright hired by a theater to their, um, the people who are gonna buy the tickets or like the perceived people who are gonna buy the tickets, like their audience and just like, just something around the, burden of representation like uh, I felt as like a commissioned queer artist to like explain queerness to um, a audience that would include like mostly straight people and like the assumption that um, that was a job that was appropriate for anyone to do um, and then also just like the like struggles around um, casting people who actually have the experiences or who actually have the identities of like the people in the show you know and how like yeah a case sometimes has to be made for that and that's like totally messed up like that's like not something that should happen that people whose experiences are being represented to others like wouldn't have access to those roles. And so those are a couple of things. That's such an amazing point you bring up, Casey, in terms of access and again, that exclusivity of who, who like supports the current theater model economically, but what um, they, uh, what that economic support system wants on its stages and how those are very unequal. Um, Thanks again, everybody, for your awesome thoughts in the chat. Um, there are entire conversations and themes that could split off from there. Um, but I wanted to move into an, our last, is it our last 10 minutes, right, Ruthie? We've got 10 more minutes. And let me just check in, Ruthie or Kate, is there anything that you wanted to pop in before I continue on? Oh, you're doing great, Suske. Continue. Oh, good. Oh, good. Okay. Thank Happy you. Board. <laughs> You're the director to my actor. I'm doing great. <laughs> um, so uh, when we think about what systems might support art within a solidarity economy, we've actually answered that question a couple of times, I feel like, um, in the chat in different ways, um, collectively pooling resources. Um, there are different structures, um, uh, uh, different, different ways of structuring um, a, a regenerative or sustainable um, uh, uh, way of bringing collectives of theater makers together. 
one of the things that um, I've heard several theater companies do in the last year in trying to address um, equity issues, and this, this goes to that idea of time and how it is uh, taken from people is not requiring 10 out of 12s during production week for performers, um, which interestingly enough was sort of mind blowing for me when I heard that because I was like, how is it possible? You can't possibly put on a show without doing 10 out of 12s in production week. And um, yet it is possible. It's very possible. And so I'm wondering right now um, if I can again uh, pull this, this group of people um, in terms of these can be idealized systems again. Um, if, if you have a vision for some parts of uh, 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 the, the, the ecology of theater making um, uh, that would actually be supportive both of the community and um, the people making the art. For example, if, if we take uh, what Casey was speaking of, um, uh, breaking down economic hierarchies of uh, supporting the theater model, um, I uh, invite you to uh, bring your ideas forward. What can, what kind of systems can support art within a solidarity economy? Uh, some of the, and I'm going to talk a little bit just as people think, oh, good, great, Aisha saved me again. <laughs> saved all of us from my incessant prattling. I almost always have something to say, and also I love it when you talk. Um, I just, I wish, I wish that rehearsal processes were structured in a way that was uh, like parallel, poetically useful to the nature of the story that was being told. Like most rehearsal processes are four weeks. You're gonna get in, you're gonna do a week of book work, you'll talk it over, you'll get it on its feet, you're gonna walk it until it's memorized, you know all the parts, and we'll do tech week and then we'll play it for however long. And once you get to the actual opening is when you get to, you know, play the thing. But I just like, I don't know how that plays out in tech week or how that is economically viable. But I just think in the in the way of like Michael Chekhov, the four brothers of performance form freedom, beauty and a sense of the whole, like we would be satisfied as performers, audiences would be satisfied, the art itself would be satisfied if the way that we practiced the art was systemically paralleled, like fractally symmetrical with the nature of the message we're engaging in. Thank you, Aisha. I see here in the chat um, also highlights on the news. And if, if I'm interpreting this correctly, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that, yeah, what if our local news stations actually covered um, the arts um, prominently? and including them as uh, subjects of interest and import to our community, which in my mind just goes to this generalized um, uh, challenges of uh, addressing a culture that is fueled by commerce. Um, and when culture is not fueled by that commerce, how it um, often is hidden or again, only uh, available or accessible to certain people. Let's see. Rest as a part of the structure uh, that we move our perspective of a go, go, go towards a more nourishing cycle of activity. I think that's, again, with the time, a major, major issue in theater making is the sort of like, you know, what the show must go on, no matter what happens, the show must go on, right? Um, uh, let's see popularity, broad education at school. Um, Julia says, the Gordian not for me is how do we fairly compensate the artists who create the theater and at the same time make it financially accessible to our communities? Investing in culture can accelerate the economy. Both of the, those things so important. Uh, locally, uh, we are doing a lot of in Humboldt County organizing in order to um, bring the message that culture actually is a huge economic driver 
um, in, in uh, our community. And so how do we generate uh, systems that support the arts just the way the, the arts support our community? Folks, it is 3.56 right now, and I do have one more question, which is what can be implemented now? But I'm going to leave you with that in terms of um, your thoughts of what can truly be implemented now. Um, uh, because there are so many directions that we could go in with that conversation for sure. And, and I am actually interested in the follow-up to that question is what can be implemented now, but what are the challenges that might keep us from implementing those things? And if you want to put that into the chat, I would love that too, to hear, okay, this is what I want from the theater, but why, why can't I move in that direction? What is missing? It can be practical. It can be emotional. It can be personal. Um, one of the things that I've come up against recently, even though I'm involved in a lot of things, is that I just don't have the bandwidth or energy to throw myself into uh, things that I, I really do want to see happen as strongly as I could have 15 years ago. So that does prevent me from, from, from implementing some of these um, thoughts in terms of uh, recreating uh, theater structures that um, are regenerative. And if anybody has thoughts, please do raise your hand. I wish I had just a little bit more sparkle in me, but this is my, my third panel or, or support. I was supporting two other panels before and so I'd, Running on fumes a little bit, everyone. Um, you look pretty sparkly to me, Suska. That's that's just the <laughs> prism in my window. Sparkly. <laughs> well, I see the sparkle. It's there. It's still there. Oh God. Um, yes. Are there any? So so just to broaden it open, we have just just a minute left. But if there is anything that um, those of you who are here um, would have liked to have addressed in this conversation, but uh, we didn't, we didn't, um, tell us, tell us right now. Um, we have organizing for more government support of the arts is huge. And that, that has also been spread on by COVID. Mm -hmm. um, arts advocacy. Yeah. I think everybody might be tired of these deep conversations. Yes, Humboldt Creative Alliance is working on that right now. Yes. Yep, that's right. Mm -hmm. All right, Ruthie, Kate. Good discussion, everybody. I, I think we have, it's, a, it's getting to the late in the day. Um, yep, yep. It's kind of a marathon we've been running here. But we want to thank everybody um, for sharing your thoughts on this subject. Um, it's it's interesting to hear from other people. We this group um, it's it's Zuska, Kate, and I, and and a whole other. I think there's like in and out 10, 10 more other people who come in and out and we've been listening to each other talk. So it's really great uh, for almost a year. We've been listening to each other talk. So it's really great to hear from other folks. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you, everybody. We have another 30 minute break if you're coming back at 4.30. Woo, woo hoo, or 4.30 Pacific. I know that some of you are other places. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>